So what I want to do in this lecture is to uh, share with you some of the work that we are doing uh, on the neural mechanisms of space and time. I will uh, start um, with the history and the background, briefly mention the work that uh, we got the prize for, but spend most of the time on the recent work and try to share, show uh, where is uh, neuroscience um, today. So, um, let me then start with a, a movie. So I know that this is a mixed audience, so I start very simple. This is a brain, <laughs> and uh, it's a cartoon of a brain, so it shows only the neurons. Um, they, uh, there are many of them, actually, in the human brain, approximately 80 to 100 billion. And um, we also know that it's in the connections between the neurons, called synapses, that uh, most of the information lies. We know that there are approximately, on average, 10,000 synapses, connections between, uh, from each cell to other cells. So uh, we are up in the, in, the, in the range of 10 to the 14 to 10 to the 15 connections. And um, if the information is there, we know that these connections or synapses are very, very small. They are distributed, so it sounds, it sounds really like an impossible task to, to actually identify the mechanisms and uh, the, the mechanics and uh, um, the neural substrate of, uh, of uh, brain activity. But uh, there has been quite some progress, and uh, I will start in um, about 50 years ago. Um, it's more than that, actually, it's 60, 70 now. But in the 1950s uh, to 60s, uh, I think there was a major change in uh, neuroscience in the sense that uh, uh, investigators started to use new technologies to bridge two fields that had been largely separated, namely physiology and psychology. And uh, uh, naturally, much of this started in uh, studies of sensory systems. It's the easiest to access in the brain. Uh, and uh, I've shown here, uh, chosen as an illustration, the work of, of uh, David Jubel and Torsten Wiesel. They got the uh, Nobel Prize, and I think it was in 1982, for the work that started in late 1950s and in the 60s, where they showed in the visual system uh, that there are neurons that respond to specific features of the visual image. And in particular, there are neurons that respond to orientations of bars uh, or uh, lines, contours, which are, can be seen as components of the visual image. So you see that here, in, um, as you see um, examples of uh, um, lines that are shown to an animal. I think it was a cat. Um, they, um, you see the activity of neurons here, and you see that uh, when the, the, of this neuron, when the line is approximately vertical, then the cell is very active, and then you turn further, and uh, it is not active any longer. So this is the elements of vision, and uh, um, I will just use that as an example uh, of the studies that took place in the 50s, 60s, uh, and the years to and decades to come, at what I call the low end of uh, the cortex, that means uh, where the sensory inputs uh, come in. And the visual cortex has over the years served as, in many ways, a model system for understanding how, how the brain, or at least how the cortex uh, works because of uh, the information we have had about this circuit and also about uh, the relative accessibility. Um, but um, I... Uh, I'm a psychologist by training, so I, I want to understand the high-level functions as well. And uh, that has been uh, uh, guiding uh, much of the research we do in our lab. So what you see here is then an illustration of the visual system. At the bottom, you had uh, the early visual areas, including V1, which, uh, where you have the orientation selective cells, and then you can get an impression of the complexity here. But if you go to the very, very uh, top, um, you have uh, the hippocampus and the entorhinal cortex. Uh, they will also be at the top of other systems because there's a huge convergence. But th this is where um, we have done much of the work in the lab. And um, 
especially we have focused on space and time. And the question then comes up, why space and time? Well, there is a, a reason for it, uh, and that is that um, if we want to understand high-level computation, uh, there may be some merit to actually peeling away the sensor inputs. Go to an area where you can study activity that is independent or general, at least, across all the sensory inputs. Because you want to know what is the brain doing itself, regardless of uh, the inputs. And um, as you can imagine, then, then uh, we get close to uh, Immanuel Kant, who suggested that the brain has, or the mind, has uh, constraints that determine how we experience the world. And he mentioned space, he mentioned time, and he also mentioned causality, which are uh, a priori constraints that determine the way uh, we experience the world. You can never get around that. You have to experience uh, the world in the way that uh, uh, the, the brain tells uh, you, the brain itself that it has to do. It sets the constraint for space. You can't escape space. You can't uh, escape a perception of time. And then causality is more difficult, so I won't say anything uh, about that. But for that reason, uh, I think it's a good starting point for, stand, uh, for understanding high-level functions. Are, because after all, space uh, and time are accessible. They can be measured. They are well expressed in, uh, in small animals, mice, for example, rats. And, um, and uh, um, there is a huge potential for finding something useful. And also because it evolved so early, uh, then there's a high likelihood that this may be general across species. Let's begin then with space, which is where we have done most of the work. Um, so if you go to the human brain first, so what you see here is uh, the hippocampus in red and the entorhinal cortex in uh, blue. So they are not on the surface when you look at the brain from the outside. They are on the inner part of the medial te of the temporal lobe. So this is where it curves inside but it's a bit difficult to illustrate, uh, so that's why it is shown like this. But uh, in any case, those are areas that are critical for uh, perceiving space. They are certainly not the only areas, because uh, in, in many ways, all parts of the cortex are involved in some way. But there are critical areas, and we know they are important. We also know that they have an important role in, in uh, memory formation. So, uh, and. Uh, Space and time are important elements of uh, what you call episodic memories. So it's a good place to start, but the human brain is complicated, and uh, as you saw, there are many nuances there, and uh, uh, also very difficult to access. So for that reason, much of the work has been done in uh, simpler animals, including rodents, and uh, in the earlier years, much in rats, now more in mice. Um, and uh, a milestone was, of course, uh, John O'Keefe's discovery of place cells in uh, 1971. So what John uh, did, uh, which also uh, led to the Nobel Prize, and we shared it with him in 2014. Um, so this uh, started the entire field of uh, studies of space, uh, especially related to the hippocampus. Um, and uh, what he did was that he implanted very small electrodes or sensors into the brains of rats that were running around freely in the environment, in a box or in a maze, for example. And then um, during experiment, those uh, electrodes were connected to a wire so that he could uh, observe the activity of uh, um, the electrical activity of single cells on an oscilloscope and record it on a computer. Um, and these electrodes were in the hippocampus. So, uh, um, and um, O'Keefe then, uh, um, somewhat probably to his surprise, because he wasn't looking for place cells, then he, he found them in um, the hippocampus. And I will illustrate now what a place is, place cell is, by uh, playing uh, a movie. So before I start, you will see a rat running around in a box. The box is one by one meter. Um, and for the occasion, electrodes on the head are connected through a cable. The rat is running around to collect small pieces of chocolate, because they like chocolate very much, so that keeps them running all the time. And uh, uh, 
all we want is to have them visit every possible place in the box so that we can record the activity there. So you will be listening and seeing the, act to, and seeing the activity of a single cell. Uh, each time the cell is electrically active, fires an action potential, you will hear a sound pop and uh, you will also see a red dot. So let's see what happens now when we record the activity from one place cell in the hippocampus. So you see that um, this cell is active, but it's only active when the rat is in the upper left part of the box. Otherwise, it's actually totally silent, no action potentials. And you can see the, there's a cluster of activity in this area. And uh, this is then what O'Keefe would call a place field, the field where the cell is active, and the cell would be called a place cell. Most of the cells in the hippocampus are like uh, this. Um, you can see them um, illustrated in the color plot below. So that's um, a heat map that shows the activity of this particular cell. So red is high activity and blue is low activity. So it is a map of the box and you see that this cell is particularly active in the upper left part. Uh, this is uh, O'Keefe and then Linne Dell. Uh, together, after the discovery of place cells, they, the two suggested that these cells are part of an internal map in the brain uh, a cognitive map, as they uh, called it, referring back to Tolman's uh, studies in the 30s, 40s and 50s, where he suggested there must be such maps in the brain. But of course, Tolman didn't have access to neural activity data. But uh, they suggested these place cells in the hippocampus are the basis of such maps. Um, so this was in the early 70s, and years passed. Uh, more was learned about place cells. But um, the weird thing was that these place cells are in the hippocampus, deep in the brain, as you saw from this uh, cartoon in the beginning, uh, very far away from any sensory inputs or from motor outputs. So how can such cells get a so specific signal? That was uh, a deep mystery, and years passed. Not much was really learned about that. But then another accidental discovery came about 10 years, 10, 15 years later, um, when uh, Jim Rank, to the right there, and Jeff Taube, uh, his student, uh, recorded activity from another area near the hippocampus that was, uh, called, uh, is called the pre-subiculum, or they called the, the post-subiculum, but anyway. Um, um, and those were electrodes that were actually misplaced, uh, so they went into the wrong place. And then suddenly they discovered uh, a type of cell that is directionally selective. Not place selective, but direction selective. So that means whenever the rat walked in a certain direction, with a face in a certain direction, these cells were active. And you can see it on the um, diagram here. So head direction is shown on the x-axis, firing rate on the y-axis, and you can see that these cells are active only when the rat was facing about three, 240 to 300 degrees relative to the uh, external uh, room. And other cells were like that too. So what you now have is hippocampus, lots of cells that are active in different places, and in the uh, Presubiculum outside hippocampus, lots of cells that are active in, in different directions. And it's obvious that these two probably were related, and uh, this is when things really started to happen, because then people started to think about how do these signals interact, how do they get um, the place signal uh, components of the place signal get into the hippocampus to make place cells, and um, how do you put orientation and position together? So theories started to come in the 1990s. And um, then uh, in 2005, because this does take a while, then uh, my bit Moser and I started to record in an area outside the hippocampus. So in a rat brain, you see red is the, um, red is the hippocampus and blue is the entorhinal cortex. Entorhinal cortex is an area that is just outside the hippocampus and sort of um, funnels uh, information from all over the cortex into the hippocampus. Um, and it's also um, an interface between the presubiculum and that has the orientation or the head direction selective cells and the place cells. So it's, it's a natural area 
to actually ask uh, what, what kind of computations go on there. You need to put that into the equation if you want to understand how, um, how uh, place uh, is coded. And then, started to record there, you see um, the medial entorhinal cortex is the top part here. This is a rat brain seen from behind. And uh, on the top here uh, is the medial entorhinal cortex, we recorded. And you, now you see, I can play it again, a movie of uh, a typical cell. Uh, one of many cells in the entorhinal cortex, but uh, a cell that we recorded there. And you can see that uh, this particular cell is different from the hippocampal place cells in that it fires, is active at many places, but there are clusters of places, it's not randomly spread around. And those clusters, they fall bumps of activity that uh, actually form a certain pattern. And uh, you can more easily appreciate what that pattern is if you look at this map to the right. So in the background in gray, you have uh, the trace or the path of the animal, the rat, as it was running around for 30 minutes chasing chocolate pieces. And on top of it, in black dots, you have the, the places where this particular cell was active. And you can see what a regular, beautiful pattern it actually creates. It uh, consists of, um, you can consider it as a composition of equilateral triangles. Um, you can also say that the unit, the real unit is a hexagon, because that's what repeats all over without having to turn the, the triangles. But anyway, regardless, this is like a grid that covers the entire uh, environment, and for that reason we call these cells uh, grid cells. And uh, these cells contain information about um, directions, distances, and uh, they even come at different scales. Some cells have very tight fields, so the frequency, the spatial frequency of the grid is uh, small. Others have wider fields and the distance is longer. If you uh, put these together, you will actually find that you can, um, you can um, decode the position of the animal to a very high, at a very high precision. So uh, I can explain more about that in questions if you want. But at least this is one element of the positioning system. And um, the years passed and we saw that there are actually other types of cells too intermingled among, among the grid cells in the same area of entorhinal cortex. So what you see to the left here is what we call the border cell. So those cells were active only when the rat was at the borders of the local environment, along a wall, for example, in such a box. So you see in this case, uh, the rat is, uh, the cell is active only on the right side, but it's regardless of whether the box is short or long, or even if you insert a wall, like in the bottom part there, you will see that uh, 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 there will be activity along the borders in that type of cell. And, and there are also other types of cells that we discovered more recently, which uh, use a completely different way of expressing space. So while the grid cells are like a coordinate system, uh, these cells, uh, which you call object vector cells, they uh, have objects as a reference. So what's an object? Well, for example, a Lego tower that you put into the environment here and then the rat is running around. But obviously that is such a prominent landmark that the uh, mouse may be using this to decode its position in the environment. And those cells are then active at certain distances and directions from that landmark. So you can see an example here. First to the left you see uh, without the object in the box. So uh, blue means that the cell is very silent. Then introducing the object here and the, the cell is active on the left side, like you see here. Uh, if you then move the object like uh, we did in the bottom here, so the object is here in the first trial and then down in the southwest in the second trial, you can see that this cell maintains its uh, distance and direction from the, uh, um, the, the landmark or the object, uh, namely the same, uh, it's on the north side and equally far away. So um, what I've shown you here now is different types of cells. There's the grid cells, place cells, head direction cells, object vector cells, uh, border cells, 
all that have characteristic properties encoding different aspects of space. So they are like the elements of, uh, of a spatial coding system. And um, they are pretty basic in the sense that they must at least exist in all uh, mammals. So this shows an evolutionary tree for mammals. And you can see that you find the same types of cells both in uh, rodents to the left, in uh, bats. And bats are not small rats, they're not mice, they're on a completely different branch, but they still have the same types of cells. You find them in monkeys, you find them in humans. So uh, this evolved early and uh, is a fundamental part of the spatial coding system. But now, if we want to understand the spatial code, then we have to leave the level of individual cells because individual cells is not the end. They, they work together. So cells uh, operate together, just like humans operate in communities. We need to understand how they interact if we want to, to uh, understand spatial coding or any type of coding, really, in, in the brain. And uh, that is where we need pop population studies. The problem, until very recently, is that there have been no tools where you can actually record activity, not from like before, five, six cells at the same time, at best. But you need hundreds, thousands, and uh, that hasn't been possible. However, that has changed now, and now there are several new technologies that are just a few years old. Some of them are still in the making, uh, where uh, you can record activity from, yes, thousands of cells at the same time, at still the same uh, single cell resolution. And one of these uh, new inventions is uh, electrical probes that are called neural pixels probes. So they are actually computer chips, but they are so thin that they're actually just like an electrode, uh, 20, 30, uh, 70 micrometers wide, actually. Uh, and uh, then they have, instead of having the recording tip, uh, the recording point at the tip of a wire, like it was before, um, uh, now it is a chip with many, many, many spots all along the, the electrode, which you can see here. This is the first version, this is the second version, and they are just 15 micrometers apart. So, and that means that um, the newest generation of probe, NeuroPixels 2.0, you can actually record more than 5,100, I think 5,120 such spots on four electrode shanks, and uh, you can then use a certain number of those, uh, uh, I think about 1,000 uh, recording sites at the same time. And uh, that gives you then, uh, can give you several thousand cells at the same time. And the first time we used this was uh, here. And uh, this was to record uh, grid cells in the entorhinal cortex. The work of uh, Richard Gardner and Eric Hermansen in a collaboration be with, uh, between uh, um, neurophysiology and uh, mathematics. You will soon understand uh, why mathematics comes in. But um, um, this just shows uh, for each of, 149 cells, uh, um, the, what we call rate maps, it shows the activity of a particular cell in one of these square boxes where you saw the rat was running around. And you can see the grid pattern for each of the cells. So these 149 cells are a subset of the cells that we recorded. It's all the grid cells that had the same orientation and same spacing. The total number of grid cells was 483, and the total number of cells recorded was 2,460. But, um, well, we want to leave the single cell uh, analysis, and that brings me then to this plot, oops, sorry, this plot here. This is um, um, a raster plot, as we call it, that shows the activity of those 149 cells. Each is a line here, so it's 149 lines. And the black versus white shows the activity of the cell. And on uh, the x-axis, you have time. This is about five, six seconds. And uh, you can then make a small, uh, chop out small segments of time. And then you can ask, what is the simultaneous activity of all those cells at any given time? Not what is, the, is one single cell doing, but what is the combined activity at any given time? And uh, that's where you can really gain new insights. But uh, this uh, introduces new complexity. Because if you have, let's say, 149 cells, if you allow all those cells to vary completely independently, 
then the activity would uh, move around in a 149 dimensional coordinate system and, and we can't imagine that that's impossible to imagine right so um, but fortunately and especially in this system uh, the activity of the cells is so correlated that you can break it down from 149 dimensions to for example three and you still keep very much of the variance the variation in the activity so using these uh, techniques uh, principal component analysis and more modern techniques like UMAP, you can also break down the activity in this raster plot to three dimensions and then plot, plot it, the movement across time. And in these plots, in these point clouds, as we call them, each dot is one of these red time points, which illustrates the combined activity uh, broken down in three dimensions. And in these three dimensions, you get one dot per time, and then each time is then a different dot, and then you can see over time, first of all, a trace that shows the movement of the combined activity, but the, the important thing here is that you can see that this cloud of activity actually is a torus or a donut, if you want. But torus is the mathematical name. And uh, that happens every time in all grid cells. You cannot escape it. It is really moving around on a torus. And uh, the way to really show that is to use methods from the mathematical field of uh, topology, topological data analysis, and then you can use certain techniques to count the number of holes. And what you would expect, if it is a torus, is that you would expect one hole in, uh, you would expect two holes um, in one dimension, that means two rings, and you can see the two rings here, there's one there and one there. And you would expect one hole in two dimensions, so that's the inside of the torus or inside of the donut. And if you count these holes using these techniques, you uh, will find the following. So this is uh, a recording from uh, uh, just a rat running around in a box open field. And uh, you illustrate um, the size of the holes in one dimension. That is the uh, number one here, one dimension here, and in two dimensions. So can you see that in one dimension, it is uh, two very long lines. That means that there are two holes in one dimension. And there's one long line in two dimensions, which means that there is uh, one hole in two dimensions. And this is a torus. So this is the mathematical way to demonstrate that uh, this activity actually moves on a torus. And that happens not only when uh, the rats are running this box, but also when they run on different mazes and it's difficult to see the grid pattern in single cells. And most importantly, still the same when they are sleeping during REM sleep, which at least in humans correlates with dreaming, and in slow wave sleep, which is the deep sleep when, uh, when the activity is really much lower. Uh, so that means that the grid cells express their repetitive pattern in two dimensions still when the rats are sleeping. You don't have to run around and navigate. It's just something intrinsic to the circuit, and you cannot get rid of it. This is something the cells just do. And, uh, that is, uh, uh, confirms a major prediction of one of very few theories in uh, neuroscience. Uh, it's a type family of theories that's called uh, continuous attractor network theories. And uh, it is uh, too much to explain here, but the idea is that um, if you have certain types of connectivity between cells, then you can force the activity in huge neural networks to stay on certain um, manifolds or certain planes in, in the room and avoid many, many possible combinations, but just stay on a very few. And that's exactly what, what uh, the activity does when it moves around on an internal map in the, in the brain. Um, it also verifies that this has to happen. It has to be circular in some way, like on a torus. It could have been on a sphere, could have been on a ring. But if you have a map, an internal map in the brain of the world, and it was flat, then you would have the same problem that uh, geographers had uh, when they thought that the world was flat. Because what happens when you come to the end? Well, you don't fall out. So um, if you instead connect the map around on both sides, you can get the torus, and that means you can move around on that map forever and never fall off. 
So there's a lot of things that make sense when it actually has this uh, the torus uh, shape. Then I, um, I want to uh, say a few words about other ways, uh, new technologies. So uh, uh, because we also want to see the cells, if you really want to understand, you can't just record uh, electrical signals. And for that, there are new microscopes that we have been developing in the lab. But first, what has it been like until now? So uh, if you want a two photon microscope in order to, you can use two photon microscopes to study uh, the activity of, uh, of uh, uh, single cells. Um, you can study calcium transients in single cells. But the way you had to do that before was to have mice run on a ball, but you have to head fix them during the experiment so that they run in virtual environments like this. It looks like a city, they're running in it, but they're not moving. But uh, this is certainly not real, and a much better way to do it is to design uh, very small microscopes that you implant on the head of the animal instead of the electrodes, and you can then visualize the activity in the cells. But um, the ones that have existed so far have very poor resolution, and they don't really help very much to see the cells. And for that reason, investigators have tried to develop two photon microscopes that can be used in freely moving uh, mice where they can run around freely with no disturbance. Uh, this started in 2001, but it is not until now that uh, they have been working because they haven't been too big or too clumsy or the optics has been bad and so on. So a new microscope, we designed that together with Wei Jian Song in our lab. And uh, I will just uh, go quickly through that, but uh, the message is, with this microscope, it is so light and so small, and the cable is so flexible that um, the mice can run. So you see the traces of uh, a mouse running with such a microscope on the head in the middle, and it's indistinguishable from a mouse that is running with nothing on, on the head. So finally, they are small enough, they are light enough, and uh, still have the resolution of a two-photon microscope where you can clearly distinguish every neighboring cell uh, from each other. If you do that, I'll show you an example here. So this is activity from the visual cortex, and you see the blinking cells uh, uh, as a, at the same time as the mouse is running around in a box and, and chasing chocolate pieces. Uh, and this is in four planes, 200 micrometers between, and uh, you can do 40 hertz, that means 10 hertz per, you scan each image 10 times a second uh, for each. So you can capture quite a lot of the dynamics doesn't have the same temporal resolution as the, um, as the neural pixels, but it has certainly a much better spatial resolution. And because it is so uh, light and flexible, the, the mice can do anything like climbing vertical towers. This is 20 centimeter towers, there's just a biscuit on top, and they like the biscuit, so they do this, they uh, go up and eat it while we do the imaging, and then they jump down, and that's no problem. You can even image during the jump and then they do this over and over again. So with this technology, it is possible to, um, to uh, make maps of uh, cells in the spatial coding system. Grid cells shown here in red, uh, object vector cells in blue, and you can then start to map out how the activity is. And what we're now doing is that we're not recording only, we can also target these cells and stimulate them and then see what happens when uh, when you, um, when you stimulate one cell, how does that influence the activity of, of the rest of uh, uh, the network? So for the remaining time, I'll say a few words about uh, the second topic, namely time. We know much less about time than uh, about space. So time is all over the brain. Uh, so uh, in that sense, it should have been studied much more. But it is also a very different concept, and we don't even know to what extent does the brain really um, record or express time, or does it just make it up? Um, but there are um, increasing numbers of studies, and I will begin with the uh, encoding of duration. So this is the work of Albert Sau, who started this in 2018. He uh, started recording in the lateral part of the entorhinal cortex, where uh, um, which is the sister area of the medial entorhinal. Medial is where the space cells are. Lateral uh, is completely unknown. And uh, when we started recording there, um, 
we really didn't know what uh, to expect. Um, and what Albert noticed uh, was that cells were not stable. And so we thought for a long time there's something wrong with the recordings because they are changing all the time. And you can see an example here from an experiment where um, a rat was running in 11 boxes after one another over a period of two hours, alternating black and white and black and white. And you can see the instability of uh, the cells. So this one, for example, at the top here, uh, is um, ramping up uh, several times. Each time the rat is going to, to a new, uh, a new uh, box in this sequence of 12 boxes, then the activity starts low and goes gradually up. Other cells ramp uh, down, yet others over a much longer time scale. So uh, some cells go up, other cells go down, and it was hard to understand. But in the end, we actually uh, concluded that this is what, <laughs> what this is real. It's not a technical artifact. The cells do change, they do drift over time, and they correlate with the passage of time. And um, this became even clearer when we, again, could introduce the neuropixels probes, recording thousands of cells instead of just a few. And this is from recordings with, uh, um, where uh, around 1,000 cells in, in lateral entorhinal cortex, sometimes at the same time as medial and entorhinal cortex and hippocampus. And what you now see is if you do the same dimensionality reduction, so you start out with, uh, for example, a 1,000-dimensional coordinate system with 1,000 cells, but then you break it down to the essence, uh, to two dimensions in this case, and then plot the activity. This is what you get. So if you now look at the left, that's a recording from the lateral entorhinal cortex, and color indicates the passage of time from beginning to end of a trial, over 10 minutes. So white is beginning, and red, dark red is end of the trial. And each circle here is one minute, and you can then see how the activity actually moves systematically through this uh, uh, this uh, uh, space. It's not, uh, not space in the room, but it is uh, a space that you have created by breaking down to the dimensions that explain the most. So this systematic movement, instability, uh, or drift in the entorhinal, lateral entorhinal cortex, but not in the two other areas where we uh, recorded at the same time. So... Uh, um, it just is an inherent feature of this brain area's activity, and uh, uh, it's almost like the activity just goes away from itself more than you even would expect by, by chance. Um, there's still one thing, important thing to say about that, namely that uh, this correlates with time, but it is not linearly uh, related to time. Uh, so it is faster at the beginning of a trial, so it goes very fast in the beginning, as you can see, and then slows down. And if you um, introduce, if you now look at the bottom, if you introduce something interesting to the rat, for example, you put a new object, like a tower, Lego tower, for example, in, then you can see that the change from the previous uh, recording, is, there's a huge jump each time you introduce this new object here, and then again there. Uh, so it means that uh, it is actually uh, the activity you see is a reflection of uh, the structure of events. So each time there's something interesting happening to the rat, it's a reward, it's a surprising object, then it jumps more. And if it's very, very boring, nothing happens, then it goes much, much slower. So finally, a few words about uh, another form of time, namely order. And, um, and uh, I'll, I shall take this very quick. Order of activity is also uh, um, a feature of time. And the way we uh, studied that is to put uh, mice again under a microscope. This is uh, one of the stationary microscopes in complete darkness. There's no rewards, nothing, but they still like to run. So they run on this ball, nothing happens. This is a work of Soledad uh, Co uh, Gonzalo Cogno. And uh, what she observed uh, when recording on the microscope from entorhinal cortex in this uh, condition is that um, uh, the cells, first of all, are oscillatory, but the oscillatory frequency 
uh, is uh, for individual cells is in the order of one minute. So it's really, really slow oscillations. And uh, this can engage almost all of the cells under this uh, very stereotyped condition. And what's even more surprising is that it's not just that the cells go up and down in activity, but they actually are arranged in sequences where if you have, uh, if you have uh, 20 cells, then it's uh, first A and then B and then C and then D and E. They fire after one another in a very stereotypic sequences that you can see if you arrange the cells by uh, using either correlation methods or, uh, or um, PCA sorting methods regardless. If, there are ways that you can sort the cells so that you can see that it's in the, under those conditions the cells have the ability to arrange themselves into sequences that uh, actually repeat periodically and you can see these repetitions here. You can actually plot them on a ring it just goes round and round and round while they're running on these, uh, uh, in this very, very stereotyped uh, task. And uh, the periods can be in the, uh, typically in the order of one minute but they can also be shorter and uh, uh, longer. It's not related to behavior, so if you, um, if you study the waves or the sequences on the conditions when it's running, so it's running here where it's blue and it's stationary, just sitting on it's uh, white, you can see that uh, the sequences go on independently of behavior. So something intrinsic to the circuit. So uh, of course the cells do not do this normally, but it shows that there is the potential, probably some uh, template or scaffold in the system that can generate sequences that can be used when you actually need to encode sequences. Then you have these sequences and you can use them very rapidly to encode memories. So then to sum up, um, I've shown you for space and time, I've shown you that in the space system there are cells that when reviewed as a population they have the ability to force activity to move around on a very low dimensional system to, to visit just in this space, just very selected places that are like a map where the activity can move around and this actually has the shape of a torus. I've shown you for time that, um, that the activity here is very, very different in the lateral part of the cortex in, in the sense that it's not attractive going to the same places or same states all the time, but rather repulsive, getting more and more different all the time, which is a signature of the passage of time. But then this is, as I said, it's not linear, but it tends to make jumps each time, uh, each time something more important happens, and that's why it is discrete. So you can say if there are significant events here, you can group them into the green one, the blue one, the uh, uh, purple one, and so on here. And then when you retrieve it later, you tend to block them into these um, um, groups of events or segments uh, of events, if you want. Finally, I also showed you that, um, that uh, the system uh, in the enterprise core has the ability to generate sequences um, it doesn't use them all the time, naturally, but if you put the animal in very artificial uh, conditions, you can actually reveal these sequences. And I think they operate like a template that can be used when the brain actually has to encode sequences. And sequences, as you know, are part of all the memories that we store, uh, depend on the ability of the brain to form particular sequences. Finally, two words about the potential relevance of this. So um, it is uh, a fact that uh, in Alzheimer's disease, one of, uh, uh, or the brain area that very often is, uh, shows uh, the generation of cells uh, first in the cortex is uh, the entorhinal cortex, and especially the lateral entorhinal cortex. And at the bottom here, you see um, um, from um, um, normal brain to the left, mild cognitive impairment to to in the middle and then full-blown Alzheimer's disease to, but still early stage to, to, to the right and you can see how the density of cells decreases. So this was known already in the early 1990s but uh, it is first uh, over the years that's been shown that uh, the volume of entorhinal cortex is actually 
predictive, the reductions in the volume of entorhinal cortex is predictive of uh, uh, or correlated with the later expression of, uh, of Alzheimer's disease. And that, of course, goes along with uh, dysfunctions in spatial orientation, uh, time, and, uh, and, and memory. So with that, we'll just say that um, solving Alzheimer's is, uh, is a big task. Um, it is becoming more and more uh, urgent to actually do something with it because the uh, population is aging, and uh, so we all know it's an age-dependent disease. So um, that's an illustration of how you actually, when you do basic research, try to understand the normal functions of the brain as we do, it will have spin-offs that we didn't think about when we started it. So that has happened many times in history, as you all know, uh, and which has been shown here at this university as well. So the Volt, uh, Volt, Volta's studies is a very good example of that. But let me then uh, finally just uh, put up a slide with all the people who have been involved. I mentioned many of them on the way, and uh, Maybrit Moser has been uh, uh, part of all of the work together with my, myself, but then uh, the names of all the students and postdocs uh, are on, on this list, and uh, of course a lot of people have funded the work too. So thank you very much for the attention. Okay, I'll sit if we better, we'll sit. So dear Edward, needless to say that of course our university is extremely proud and honored to guest you for the first time in Italy for this special Nobel Prize initiative. As you can see from the audience, your arrival has really excited the Pavia community involving students, researchers, and also a lot of citizens. This is for two things. One is your, uh, for your extraordinary results. You have uh, uh, now presented beautifully. But also, I think, for the high level of understandable curiosity that move all of us for the prestigious history of the Nobel Prize. And uh, as I told you already, uh, this large audience uh, involves not only people from the Pavia community, but also people coming from other cities, universities, and schools. So it's a very mixed uh, uh, audience. Now, in general, after such a beautiful keynote lecture, um, questions are not uh, foreseen, but uh, considering your high interest to keep in touch directly with the audience, not only today but also tomorrow, uh, we are going to make a special exec exception for you. And, uh, well, I will start to warm up the atmosphere. And what I'm going to do is not going into details of your scientific results, because we will have time, time tomorrow uh, with students in small group and round tables to go into the details of your scientific research. So I'm going to pose you very general questions. And I was referring uh, at the very start of my small talk uh, to the curiosity of people con uh, about the Nobel Prize. Uh, and uh, I'm sorry for this banal question, but we are very curious to know how was the first day, the day, when they communicate you about the, the, the Nobel Prize? Because we know a lot about, you know, uh, divulgative uh, <laughs> print, but I want to know directly from you, how was the story? Were you excited? Uh, and stuff like this. Well, uh, as you no, the normal thing is that you get a phone call. Uh, they didn't succeed with me because I was on a plane. I was um, flying from uh, Norway to uh, Munich and I was working on a paper, so everyone else knew, but I had no clue. So I, uh, but uh, when I landed, then uh, uh, they tried actually to reach the pilot, but for some reason they didn't. Uh, didn't get, uh, they didn't succeed. So I landed and then I came out of the plane 
and uh, I was trying to find my way as quickly as possible. And then there was a car waiting for me, and uh, there was a woman with flowers. And uh, it, was, it didn't strike my mind. <laughs> that, uh, I didn't even think, I didn't, had forgotten that it was the day of the Nobel Prize announcement. Uh, so I asked why, uh, why flowers, and she said it was something from the Max Planck. Well, okay, a prize from Max Planck. And I didn't know about that prize, uh, prize so uh, I was still very confused. But then on that car, when she drove me through the airport, um, I started checking my phone and then saw that there were three, four hundred calls that <laughs> during that flight and, uh, and lots of text messages. But there was uh, one name that I recognized, uh, Joran Hansson, who was uh, secretary of the Nobel Committee at that time. And then I started, oh yes, it's that day. And then I wonder, well, does he want my comment on someone who won, <laughs> won the prize? That was my first thought. But then, uh, um, then I started reading more, and then I understood. And he said that you have to call me back, so I called him back. <laughs> so. Thank you so much. So um, coming uh, to the scientific research, um, there are two components that to me are quite important in research that are creativity and then uh, the so-called serendipity effect. So I'm asking you, how does creativity play a role in science to you? And then do you have any results derived from serendipity to talk about uh, that changed your research? Yeah, about serendipity, I, I, I think actually I mentioned uh, three important discoveries that were made in, uh, in, in, in uh, the area of uh, spatial coding. So it was the play cells, it was the head direction cells, and it was the grid cells. They were all discovered by chance, not expected, not predicted. Uh, but I think still what, uh, what was important was that uh, it was a prepared mind. So I think in all three cases, uh, they and we knew that this was something important uh, and uh, could then interpret it in some context and take it further. Um, so if you go back in history, there are actually several people who have been recording activity in the same brain areas and had the data but didn't see it. Uh, so uh, I think, um, especially in a field like neuroscience, which is a very young discipline, um, there is not one grand theory where everyone agrees that this is what you should, this is the experiment you should do, and the outcomes are either, either A, B, or C. Uh, it's not like uh, particle physics, for elementary particle physics. So um, um, when it is so complex, so confusing, you have to rely on some degree of serendipity, but uh, it is, uh, um, the more you know in advance, the better you can interpret the data. And uh, you learn to design your experiments to not only test an idea, but to allow for the unexpected to happen. And uh, sort of, in that way, you can use your creativity to make conditions such that you can actually observe something. But I still do think it is important and absolutely critical to, um, to um, be guided by hypotheses, theories, uh, because you have to see the grand picture, and then you may be wrong, but at least uh, I think you will find much more if you, if you have an idea about what to look for, um, as opposed to what is of, often called data-driven, where you start completely bottom-up. I'm not a fan of that. <laughs> Thank you very much. And then you were flying, you know, you were traveling. And uh, Christine and myself, we were, we were uh, asking each other uh, before your talk, how is important, has been important for you to travel a lot and then being in different center in the world for your science and for your projects? Yeah, of course, that's also an, it's an inverse U-shaped curve. If you travel too little, you don't get exposed to ideas and people who think differently. So that's very important to interact with people who, are, who have different perspective uh, and who know something you don't know yourself. Uh, but of course, uh, you can't travel so much that you, you need some time at home uh, to be with the lab and to do experiments and to think. Uh, relax. So um, up to some point it is important, but not too much. Thank you. 
And then, you know, my last question before uh, going to the audience, uh, um, I think this is a suggestion for students and uh, researchers. Um, I don't think this is your main problem and also of your collaborators, but my question is, how do you deal with paper rejection? <laughs> uh, well, I, I, I think uh, it was worse in early years than now, so uh, I, I think... Uh, but I, I know that if you're a young investigator, if you're, if you're, you're written your PhD, or you're doing your postdoc, and your most important work, you, you all feel it's like your child, right? And it's rejected. That's, uh, that's hard to handle. Uh, but, um, and then, but then there are two types of rejections. This is the constructive type, and there's uh, the less constructive type. So, uh, I mean, with rejections, sometimes it comes with really good uh, suggestions and just means you have to do something else and you have to do uh, something additional or you have to do it slightly different and it becomes much better. And then it's, it's good, it's really good. But uh, of course, it's not easy to accept that immediately. And then, of course, there are also stupid rejections that are based on misinformation or, or superficial. No one likes that. And that uh, but. Uh, but uh, ah, of course that happens, uh, so human beings, so. I agree, and yeah. also, as you mentioned now, it's also prob a problem of reviewing the system, uh, which is more complex, okay? Yes. You know, the word is discussing this. Now, uh, a very large audience, uh, you would not be surprised that also colleagues and friends uh, are in the audience, such as, for example, Egidio D'Angelo, you shared sometimes, uh, you were next, uh, the same labs uh, in Norway, and then also uh, Eraldo Paulesu, who invited you uh, in Bressanone one year after you won your Nobel Prize, uh, and then also Stefano Kappa, who is coming from the use of Pavia, and uh, we with both uh, Stefano Kappa and uh, Eraldo Paulesu, you shared a lot, quite a long time because you were standing together in the ERC panel, and I'm sure that uh, you know some questions are coming from the audience. So I'm just inviting you, please. Thank you. So uh, I don't repeat what has uh, already been said. An outstanding presentation. I think very clear to everybody, also for those who are not in the field. Um, there is a, an, an issue that I would like you uh, talk about more, is the relationship between the space-time representation and memory, because it is not immediate. Sure, um, that's um, a very good point, because uh, space and time come together um, in memory, so uh, that uh, can be described both uh, uh, in terms of brain anatomy and also conceptually in, in, uh, uh, without involving anatomy. But if you imagine you have the hippocampus, which um, I said very early on was important for memories, but I didn't go further into that. Um, and you have the entorhinal cortex, has two parts, the medial, for, uh, which is very important for encoding space, and the lateral, which expresses the passage of time. Both, of the, both the medial and the lateral uh, come together, they project into the hippocampus, and then these inputs are integrated. And uh, one simple way of thinking of it is that the memories that are created in the hippocampus, which are known to be what you often call episodic, there's memories of daily life events, um, they contain, um, they always contain information about uh, Space and time is always part of the memory. You can't imagine a uh, memory of an event without some space in it, a location. And it also, has, um, uh, it also has elements of time, like the order of events. Things happen um, in a sequence. And um, also, often, some estimate of the duration. Is it long, short, and so on? So all of this comes together and forms the basis for episodic memories, which are stored in the hippocampus, but then, of course, not alone, works together again with the, the entorhinal cortex and the system beyond. But um, um, many people know is if you have a, a lesion in the hippocampus, then you lose the abilities to form these uh, memories, and especially new memories. And, uh, and uh, I, I often see, I see these uh, inputs from space and time expressing circuits as um, key elements for the formation of these episodic memories in the hippocampus. 
Thank you, Edward. It was a truly inspiring talk. And of the many things I really like, uh, the bits on time uh, sampling, and it's very intriguing to know that there are uh, cellular assembly that generates some sort of samplers of time scales of different grains. Now, I want, uh, as you know, in uh, human physiology or even in neuropsychology, there, is, there are beliefs that the motor system should be very much involved in time appreciation, for example. So I wonder whether you hypothesize that those cell assembly are connected to some extent to the motor system as well, and whether this could contribute to also appreciation of time. Um, well, I, I would say that um, um, many of the mechanisms that I describe occur in some form also in other brain systems. So, uh, for example, in the motor cortex, you can uh, plot activity in neural populations, and you can see also that um, that you have trajectories that go through uh, this um, um, state space, as we call it. Um, but quite often, then you see that if an animal makes a certain movement, then it's a certain trajectory that is repeated over and over again. Um, but it's the same principle that in these trajectories, there is also an element of durations, so that uh, the more it moves away, the, the, the more time has passed, and for, at least for short durations in the order of seconds or so, then you can actually tell from the movement through these uh, um, cellular assemblies uh, how much time has passed. So um, I would say that the expression of time, and especially duration uh, of time, is all over the brain. Many, many systems uh, do that, including the motor system. But then there must be some overall coordination that takes place for our perception of time, when we perceive that some time has uh, passed, then I think the system that I described is, um, is critical. It is also uh, critical for, for how we evaluate the passage of time, because that evaluation is based very much on memory. At least when you look backward in time, it's not really, um, the brain doesn't have a clock, so what we do is to accumulate experiences and then estimate out from that how much time has passed. And that is somewhat different from what you have in the motor system when, you, when, when, for example, the brain has to estimate how long time does it take before someone call, throws a ball and you have to grasp it, then you have to estimate that very precisely. But I think when it comes to episodic times, the experience of whether um, a lecture was boring or interesting is very different from <laughs> what happens, right? And uh, if nothing happened, if I had just been sitting here for the entire time, you might have perceived it as, uh, um, at least when it's going on, as very, very long. Uh, but uh, when you look back from it, it's different because you don't remember anything. And then you may say it was actually short. So it, it depends. But uh, I think com coming back to the question of how is this synchronized and integrated, um, as obviously there is integration, must be integration between the systems, uh, but exactly how that happens, at least at the cellular level, that uh, is still, uh, still up for study. Thank you very much. I thought that was great. I was just thinking about asking a sort of philosophical questions. <laughs> that is, uh, what do, how do you see the continuity between the hippocampal func function in the, the rat model you have been using primates and humans. So that is, adding on on the same mechanism or something new happening? Yeah, I, um, I think um, um, maybe if we step aside, I don't think about the hippocampus immediately, but uh, one of the uh, functions that brains or nervous systems had to solve very, very early is space, because uh, animals can't survive unless they are able to navigate. So it, and, and you can even see elements of uh, space circuits in, even in flies. So it is very general. So, uh, but, uh, but, uh, um, so much of the work we have been doing, as you know, um, is then in rats and in mice. And you may wonder then, has more been added on in primates, for example? And um, I think that is very likely. And, 
I think you can use a space system as a template for many other functions. Um, and there are many other types of sp spaces that you can sort of, you can, um, for example, there have been ideas about concepts where you can bring them down into spaces where you actually exploit the brain's ability to view things in, uh, in a space space, right? But, uh, uh, but um, um, I would say that although there is some evidence for it, I still think it is um, a long way to go because these things are very hard to measure in humans, you have to use indirect methods, so mostly uh, fMRI, but then you don't, um, you have then only indirect ways of measuring uh, grid cell activity. Of course, there are recordings that take place directly in human brains in patients who have severe epilepsy, uh, where you have to uh, record in order for surgical purposes, but, uh, but that is still very, very early, and you don't have uh, enough data to really tell uh, that uh, what these cells are doing yet. Hi, thank you for your uh, very interesting talk. Uh, I have a couple of questions actually, and sorry if these questions are stupid because I'm not an expert in uh, mice studies. Uh, so I was just wondering, when you showed the video of the mice, they were always moving in a box that were flat, like the surface was flat. And because you talk about different dimension of space, so obviously uh, space is, is very complex. I was wondering if you had some data about uh, mice changing different floors. For example, if there's some sort of gravity cells that track also the position in the vertical uh, space. And this is more practical, and the second one is a bit more philosophical too. Uh, from your talk, I had the impression that uh, you consider, or maybe this is something I, I um, only I, I don't know, had this impression, that you consider uh, the sort of the internal cortex as the neural basis for the a priori constraint of Kant, right? Or is this, because they're like, they're shaping our experience, right? So could, they, could it be considered something like this? This is my question. Yeah, um, two very different questions, but I be, will begin with uh, the three-dimensional one. So both were excellent questions, so you, you're not stupid. <laughs> but uh, let me begin then with, uh, uh, it's, a, it's absolutely a relevant question. So we, I mean, the, the approach we have tried to follow um, is always to start simple. Uh, because of the high complexity in, in the data. But uh, we, um, both we and others have um, tried to record activity from cells in more complex environments. And um, especially other groups have, uh, have even recorded from grid cells when, um, in bats when they are flying. And also in rats when, or, yeah, in rats when they are climbing even vertical walls. Uh, um, in the rats, what often happens is that uh, uh, the activity, uh, a grid-like pattern you get when uh, a rat or a mouse walks on a horizontal surface is sort of just repeated in the vertical sense. So um, um, it still seems two-dimensional in a sense, but um, so far the data don't suggest you really get a three-dimensional grid pattern um, there's something similar to that in the data from bats, but uh, it is much more um, uh, irregular than you see in two dimensions. What that means is still to be determined. It could be that, that there is a grid pattern in the brain, but the, the way that it's sort of projected onto the external space is much less accurate when you fly in an empty room, for example. Um, but um, one of the really important things is that, uh, um, I mean, this work that we are doing now it will still take a couple of years to actually see if this toroidal torus uh, pattern is still present uh, in when, uh, when animals move, mice move in three dimensions because they, mice climb, they can even walk upside down on, on, the, on the ceiling of, of uh, the cage. So, so that, that is to totally doable. But um, we don't know yet. I would really expect it, uh, since we haven't been able to get rid of the Taurus in any way whatsoever. Um, and the other question about Kant, no, I wouldn't equate any brain area directly with uh, a Kant, but uh, when it comes to 
Um, so, but I wouldn't, I would neither say ne nor, uh, no nor yes. But I, I still think there is a point because um, 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 if you reinterpret uh, Kant in in modern brain science, then uh, you can you can. Uh, to some extent, what he says is that uh, the way we perceive space is constrained by how the brain is wired, and you can't really perceive space in any other way. And to some extent, I think that is expressed by the fact that uh, cells are connected together to form patterns that uh, move around on a torus and so on. So, so I think um, to some extent, yes, but I would be very, very resistant uh, or reluctant to to equate uh, the entire sense of space, sense in quotation marks, with only one brain area, because um, it's so much more. I was wondering if, uh, using your word, you can get rid of the torus in newborns or newborn mice, mice or if it's a stable observation uh, uh, and it's independent from uh, the age of the subject. Thank you. Yeah, yeah no, uh, that's a, a good question. So uh, if you take the view that, uh, that uh, space is a function of how the brain is wired, and um, this is not really generated by experience, uh, then uh, obviously we would like to see how early can you see these uh, grid cells. That we have done. So about 10 years ago, we, we still show that they are present when uh, rats are about um, 18 to 20 days old. That is when they start walking. Before that, they just lie in the nest together with their mom. Uh, so already then, it is there. It is somewhat um, more irregular, but not a lot, really. More recently, uh, we have data in the lab that show um, uh, where, um, uh, we see that uh, the, um, that the uh, uh, even the torus is there very early on, and uh, um, at least by the time they start exploring. And uh, I think uh, as these experiments will go on, uh, we'll probably, I think we'll probably see that, um, that uh, as soon as the circuit is, the neural circuit is more or less mature, it will be there. Um, I don't think, it does not seem to depend on experience in any significant way, really. So that's totally consistent with the content.